Okay, we'll go ahead and get started at 6.30 and uh, let me move some things out of the way here. And yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, great to see the turnout. We've already got 60 folks uh, in the room already and I'm sure there'll be more uh, come on here in the next few minutes. So I really appreciate the interest and uh, uh, this will be our winter weather spotter training for the winter 2022-23 season and it's already started. We already got some snow out there this morning. I measured a half inch of snow at my house in uh, Putnam County, West Virginia. So uh, winter's already underway. So um, uh, excited to be able to speak to you all this evening and uh, we'll record this webinar. We'll put it up on our spotter page and uh, I'm also going to plan on sending it out to our spotter email list. That way folks that can attend uh, the training live will be able to do so. All right, so we'll go ahead and kick off the presentation here with a little bit of information from me. Um, for those I haven't met, I do see a lot of uh, familiar names on here, but uh, a lot that uh, a lot of, that I don't know. So uh, my name is Tony Edwards. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the Weather Service here in Charleston, West Virginia. Um, I'm the liaison pretty much with those who use our information and that's pretty much everybody. So, uh, but I work really closely with emergency management, see some emergency management friends here on the, on the, uh, the list. And, and so I work really closely with them and, and the public also uh, doing these types of outreach. And, and but uh, if you have a question, you have a concern about uh, what we do, our products and services, don't hesitate to give me a, give me a shout. You can get my, uh, my phone number there, my email. And uh, that phone number rings straight through to my cell when I'm not in the office. So, um, you know, use it with uh, with caution. <laughs> but I am putting that out there. So, uh, uh, so feel free to if you have any issue, give me a give me a call. Um, just a little housekeeping with the GoTo webinar here. Um, if you've never used it before, it can be a little bit confusing. But you should see the window. Um, on the little screen capture here. You should see that on your screen somewhere. If not, it could be minimized and just click on the orange arrow that you see and that'll open it up. Uh, the way I wanna do this, since we do have quite a few people on here and I'm doing it by myself, um, is if you have a question or um, anything that I'm talking about spurs a question, just go ahead and type it in the chat box and you can just do that as we go through the presentation. And uh, what I'll do is at the end, I'll take a look at all the questions that have submitted and we'll have a, a question and answer session at the end. So again, if you have a question, just type it in the chat box um, and, uh, and we'll get to it at the end of the presentation. All right, so bottom line up front, if you don't get anything else out of this webinar, uh, I want you to understand that your observations of snow and ice are extremely important to us. Um, this is a list of just some of the things we do with your observations. Uh, we adjust our forecasts as needed. Um, we're gonna talk about how complicated forecasting winter storms is, and especially for our region, some of the difficulties that we have, some of the challenges that we have. And so sometimes we're waiting on the precipitation to start before we know exactly what it's going to be. And again, I'll talk about why that is in a minute, but you're, um, observations basically using the Imping app or uh, sending us a report online can really help us adjust our forecast as needed in these challenging winter storms where you've got all kinds of different precipitation types. Uh, we send your reports out to the media and the world as local storm reports and you know your report could help change someone's plans and really save a life. I, I take for instance maybe you're the first one up on a Tuesday morning when it's snowing outside. You send us a report, an inch of snow, the roads are slick. We send that out to the media, the media picks it up and 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 they broadcast it on their you know on their morning uh, uh, news and Maybe somebody changes their plan because of that information, uh, and it, you know maybe they'd have had a wreck that day. So you don't, you just your 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 observations are extremely important, and they really can um, help help save lives in the long run. Uh, we use them for verification. Uh, we keep track of reports. We we uh, uh, keep track of our warnings, and we look at reports to to learn, make sure that uh, what we did issue panned out. If it didn't, why not? And they're included in post event summaries, uh, which are used by local emergency management and even FEMA in the in the bigger events. So we're going to talk about uh, what we need to know about and how to get your reports to us. 
a little later on, but it's very important that you know that your your reports of snow and ice, just like in the in the in the severe weather season, your reports of uh, tornadoes, wind damage, hail is extremely important in the winter. Snow and ice reports are extremely important to us. So here's where we're going tonight over uh, the next uh, roughly hour. Um, we'll talk about how bad winter can get around here. We'll talk about snowfall climatology for our region, some extreme winter storms and cold temperatures of the past, just to show you how cold it can get around here. Maybe you're new to the area. Um, I get uh, correspondence every now and then with spotters that are new moving into the area. So I want you to be aware of what you could uh, face in our region. And then we'll talk about some winter safety as well. And then we'll get into the, the important uh, how to observe winter weather, how to report it to us, how to properly measure snow and ice. And we'll talk about why it's so difficult to forecast winter storms in our area and how to find winter weather forecast information. And then we'll talk about the NOAA Winter Outlook. It was actually updated uh, today. Um, so I can show you some information hot off the presses when it comes to the outlook for the winter ahead. So let's talk about how winter, bad winter can be. And um, you know, if you've watched my, my webinars in the past, you've been to a spotter training, uh, I love history and I really love weather history. Uh, you know, I've lived in, in either East Tennessee, Eastern Kentucky or, or West Virginia for now, you know, 42 of my 44 years. So I love looking back over the history of this region and weather records for our region date back to the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so that history is full of, of yes, floods. That's the big thing in our region, right? It's floods, but we get severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, and some crippling winter storms. So we have this uh, hazard risk assessment webpage that uh, you can go to, and I'll click on it here and give you a little uh, idea of what that looks like, but a whole lot of statistics on here. And it, it opens up with floods and flash floods, but we also have a winter extremes tab, and you can click on here to get more information about snowfall extremes, historical cold snaps, even snowfalls of record. You know, we have uh, uh, dot that documented on here, the top 10 snowstorms of record for our climate sites, and you can click on these links and get a lot more information there. So um, that's available to you. So let's talk a little bit about some of the information on that page. So first off, how much snow is normal for our region? It varies a lot. Um, Grundy, Virginia, down in our uh, southwest Virginia counties, 16 inches of snow is the average there for a, a typical winter. But you get up to snowshoe. Um, 145 inches of snow is the average annual snowfall. So a large range in potential snowfall uh, across our region. Some of the bigger cities, Huntington averages 20 inches, but Charleston, not far away, but a little higher in elevation in, in away from the river there, uh, 32 inches of snow on average with Elkins at 69. So, um, but but snows have been a big part of our history in, in, in West Virginia. And this chart shows the emergency and disaster declarations by hazard since 1954 for the state of West Virginia alone. This is not including our Ohio counties, Kentucky counties, or Virginia counties. You can see winter storms and flooding and blizzards have been eight of those uh, disaster declarations. And even one of the hurricane related disaster declarations, which was Sandy, um, was actually winter storm for our region. We got all that snow um, across much of West Virginia, even down into uh, Southwest Virginia and Kentucky. So how much snow can we get on the on the worst case scenario? Well, the map on your right shows each county how much uh, the one day snowfall record is. And you can see it varies quite a bit. Some counties we don't have record for like Pleasance County, um, but those counties that we have records for, you can find the, the uh, total. So uh, down here in Carter County, 15 inches of snow in a one-day period is the record. Uh, you get up to uh, Washington County, Ohio, 19 and a half inches back in 1993. You'll see that 1993 is a pretty common year. That's that super storm back in March. Uh, 1950, we're going to talk about that a little bit. 36 inches in Braxton County is the one-day snowfall record. Folks, that's a lot of snow, 36 inches in 24 hours. It's a lot of snow. So winter can get pretty rough around our region. So um, you can see some past uh, uh, snowstorms at some of our bigger climate sites and that 1950 storm shows up in all but Beckley. Um, that's a big one. So we'll talk more about that now. So let's let's take a look at that great Appalachian storm in November 1950. You know, uh, if you're uh, younger, um, you know, not too many people maybe remember this storm or maybe you've not even heard about it. Um, but it really does show the extreme boundary of, of how, how bad winter can be in our region. Uh, you can see the snowfall amounts that fell greater than uh, two feet of snow. 
um, over much of the state of West Virginia back into eastern Ohio uh, with over a foot all the way down into eastern Kentucky. You can see Coburn Creek, six, West Virginia, 62 inches of snow. Uh, Pickens, 57 inches of snow. Uh, this snow fell over a roughly five-day period with winds over 30 miles per hour and temperatures in the single digits for much of that period. So really just a, a paralyzing winter storm with over 160 deaths um, in our region. So uh, this is really kind of as, as bad as it can get, and uh, it was a really, really rough snowstorm. You can see the categories here. Um, they, they've actually got a, a category for winter storms, and it was a five out of five uh, when it comes to severity of winter storms for the Ohio Valley. Now, how cold can it get? Um, and this is how cold can it get in West Virginia, but we've actually got all of our counties here in Kentucky, Ohio, Southwest Virginia, and our West Virginia counties showing the coldest temperature that has been observed on record. Uh, and it ranges anywhere from negative 39 degrees in Perry County, Ohio, back in 1899. Uh, we've had a negative 36 in Pocahontas County in 1985. You can see that 1899 date comes up quite a bit. 1985 comes up quite a bit. Uh, 1994 was a really cold spell uh, down in the coal fields and uh, uh, Putnam County where I live, 18 below. So this is kind of what you can expect as a worst case scenario. And um, man, that's it's, uh, mighty, mighty cold. So the coldest temperature observed in our region was that negative 39 at Milligan in Perry County, Ohio back in 1899. And here you can see some other notable cold spells across our region. So it's important when we're talking about winter safety that you know the, the terminology. So um, we issue these products to keep you aware of how severe we expect the upcoming system to be. And typically we start out with a winter storm watch. Now it's important to understand that when you hear a winter storm watch, maybe over the broadcast media or weather radio or however you get your information, that that watch means that conditions are favorable for a winter storm in, in usually a couple days. Uh, our confidence is medium, and, and typically the threshold is at least 50%. So uh, sometimes um, the, the low track shifts, and I'll, I'll um, show you how important that low track is here in just a minute, I'll give you an illustration of that. But maybe that low track's a little further to the east than we were expecting, or south, and, and we end up not getting any snow at all, and we have to cancel that winter storm watch. But that's okay because the potential was there at least a couple days out for a crippling winter storm. But now if our confidence increases and we get to say 80% or greater confidence that there's gonna be an impactful system, we'll either issue a winter storm warning or a winter weather advisory. And so those are both upgrades. So winter storm warning is our confidence is high that a, a really severe winter storm will impact our region. And we use a criteria to base that off of, which I'll show you in just a minute. If we don't expect maybe um, heavy enough snow or ice to cause damage, but we do expect it to be a travel concern, then a winter weather advisory is often issued, and that's for mainly light amounts of a wintry precipitation that can cause slick travel conditions. So the criteria does vary across our region, and uh, really with the, the warnings uh, from the mountains, it can be over six inches to, before we issue a, a warning. Down the lower elevations, it's around four inches, and the winter weather advisory uh, criteria can range from um, you know, an inch or two in the lower elevations to up to four inches in the mountains. So the best thing you can do to be prepared for a winter storm, and, and, it, and it's okay to do it now, you know, before the watch or warnings issued is the best time to get this together, is, is to build a kit, an emergency supply kit. And so this is really quite simple. Um, basic emergency supply kit is 20 or 72 hours worth of food, water, and any prescription drugs that you may have. Uh, may, may need. And, and don't forget about your pets. You know, you want to uh, make sure that they're um, adequately supplied as well. Now your kit can be as as elaborate as you want. You can kind of think about, you know, if, if, if we get a severe winter storm, we get a severe ice storm, I can't get out, my power's out, what do I need to be comfortable? And, and just get that together in, in some organized fashion and, uh, and, and that way you're set. And it's always important to also have a, a backup source of, of heat. You know, if you, if you do rely on electricity for your main supply of heat, what happens if the power goes out? You need a backup supply there. Uh, don't forget about your car. You know, traveling is where we have most of our issues with winter weather. You, you had a lot, of, a lot of accidents this morning uh, in just a little bit of snow that we had here in uh, really across the Metro Valley. So it's important to have some supplies in your car, first aid kit for sure, um, some flares, 
Um, sand, kitty litter, if you get stuck, you can sprinkle that over the snow and get a little traction. So here's some ideas. Uh, ready.gov slash kit is a great website to go to for your emergency kit in your house. And ready.gov slash car is a great website to go to to look at more ideas for what to put in your car uh, for if you're, if you're traveling in winter conditions and have an issue. And each year, more than 5,000 people are killed and more than 418,000 are injured due to re weather-related vehicle crashes. So winter travel is especially uh, important. And so um, take it slow in the snow. Uh, if temperatures are near freezing, drive like you're on ice because you may be. You know, if that temperature, a lot of cars have uh, thermometers in them. And if you see that's around 32, 33, and the roads are wet, just you know, drive slow because at any particular moment uh, you could get in a cold spot and or go over a bridge and then that uh, um, that could be a, a situation where you encounter some some ice. So um, check the forecast and again not only the conditions, the forecast where you're at and where you're going, make sure you check the conditions in between, especially if you're traveling over some higher elevations like we do have here in our region. And uh, finally as far as winter weather safety snow squalls. These are something that um, you may have never heard of. Um, they're basically, you can kind of think of these as thunderstorms in the winter. Um, they're, they're intense bursts of snow and wind. Sometimes they even do have thunder, uh, sometimes they don't, but they produce uh, rapidly changing conditions, rapidly changing visibility. You go from sunshine's out into a curtain of white with no visibility, and then the, the pavement goes from dry and 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 to 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 white and snow covered in a, in a matter of of minutes and so um, those rapidly deteriorating road conditions can cause problems so uh, we do issue snow squall warnings uh, that's one of the newer products that we've started issuing in the past few years and uh, these things will uh, set off your cell phone by wireless emergency alerts if we uh, put a special tag in there and so uh, we will be uh, using these products to alert folks, especially travelers on the major highways, that they could be encountering uh, snow squalls. So if you see your phone go off, if it makes a loud noise and you look it up and, and it says snow squall warning for your area, understand that if you're traveling that uh, you could encounter some rapidly changing conditions and some very dangerous driving conditions that can result, have resulted in uh, multi-car pileups um, in the past. So it's definitely a dangerous situation that you would want to take heed of. Um, other considerations, uh, hypothermia. You know, uh, hypothermia is, is a condition that occurs when the body temperature drops below 96 degrees. And uh, if you see any of the signs on here, confusion, shivering, difficulty speaking, Sleepiness, stiff uh, muscles, that's a sign of potential hypothermia and you want to seek medical attention uh, immediately. And then uh, we talked about winterizing your home. You know, uh, now's a, a big time to, if you haven't already done this, hopefully it's already been done, but inspect your chimney. You know, if you heat with wood, um, it's very important to clean that chimney out to get it inspected uh, because chimney fires are a big issue and they typically crop up that, that early in the winter when folks start using them again. Um, but it's important that maybe you use a wood chimney for a secondary source of heat if your power goes out. You know, if it's been a long time since you've cleaned that chimney and uh, then you have a long power outages uh, and, and you could start that, that, uh, that fireplace and, and you could have a chimney fire then. So it's important to, to not wait to the last minute to get that checked out. And there's some other tips on here to also winterize your home. But uh, that chimney fires are something that we see a lot and it's important to, um, to check those chimneys out, get them inspected, and get them cleaned. Backup generators. So if you do have, if you do lose power, um, be sure not to run those generators in your garage, in your house, or close to your house. You want to keep those well away because carbon monoxide uh, can um, can be a, a deadly issue with those uh, backup uh, generators, especially if uh, some people uh, tend to run those in their garage or maybe with the garage door open, but that carbon monoxide can get sucked into your into your house. So definitely a dangerous situation there, something to keep in mind. Okay, so how to properly observe winter weather. So let's talk about that. What do we need to know about? Remember I told you, uh, some of you may have come on here a little late. Um, um, I see uh, Mr. Fowler is arguing about one of his telecommunication companies there. So uh, <laughs> sorry about that, Monty, but uh, glad you could make it. Um, if you got on here late, I uh, just understand. 
take something, take this away, that, that your reports of winter precipitation are extremely important to us. And, and we want to know about your snow, how much snow you got, um, sleet, freezing rain. Um, intermediate reports are wonderful. Say we've got a longer storm coming in and we're expecting to get the snow all day. If you can, you know, you're not doing anything, you're stuck at home anyway, why not measure the snow and send us a report halfway through the event and then after it's over with. Those are, that really helps us out. Any occurrence of freezing rain and then those changeable precipitation types. Um, well, there's an app I'll talk more about in just a minute called MPing. That's a great way for you to get those reports to us to tell us what exactly it's doing in your neighborhood as far as precipitation type. Now, how to properly measure snow and ice? Well, you can do it uh, the uh, professional way, the way our, our, our um, volunteer weather observers do, or cooperative weather observers, and that's using a snowboard, which is a uh, two foot, roughly two foot by two foot piece of plywood painted white and setting out in a good exposed area away from trees or, or anything else uh, that could interfere with the snow accumulation and you may take your measurement on that. Now if you don't have a snowboard that's fine use a, a picnic table, uh, a porch, um, uh, don't measure on the grass so that's the that's the key because the grass can uh, inflate your total and so you want to measure on something that's uh, that's flat and exposed but again picnic table, porch trailing works great and uh, use a ruler, yardstick. Uh, we typically prefer measurements in tenths of an inch, but uh, again, if you've got a ruler that measures in, in fractions or whatever, that's fine, we can do the conversion. Uh, when you take your measurements, typically you, we want two things. Uh, we wanna know about the new snow, which this is the new amount of snow since the last time you measured. Uh, typically, you know, folks are measuring at the end of the storm and so that's your new snow. But if you take those intermediate measurements, so you take a measurement after six hours, uh, the snow began, and then you wipe off your board, and then you measure again in six more hours and the snow's ended. Uh, just, just understand that your storm total is the sum of those two values. Um, snow depth is the amount of snow, um, the total accumulation. So. Uh, hypothetically, say it snowed four inches yesterday and today another snow comes in. So when you do your measurement, uh, the new snow is how much this second storm brought. Uh, so you can kind of think, well, it might be handy to have two snowboards, right? You leave one out undisturbed and you use the other one to take your, your intermediate measurement. So again, say it measured four inches yesterday, today it starts snowing, the end of the day you measure another five inches. And so your total snow depth may be nine inches, eight or nine inches now, but your new snow was that five inches that fell today. So that's the difference there. And, and so not, not often do we get snows on top of snows. So typically we, you know, the new snow and snow depth will be the same, but there are a couple measurements. There's a great document here that's a link at the bottom of this slide. And again, these slides will be posted on our spotter page. I'll let you know how to get to those. Um, but uh, you can read more about how to measure snow because it can be tricky, um, um, especially in active winters. Uh, what about ice? So you folks in the tri-state region of Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia a couple years ago got a crash course in measuring ice. And so ice is a, um, a tough one. Um, but there's a couple different ways to measure ice. You can measure radial ice accumulation, which is like a, a tree limb. You use a ruler to measure the thickness of the ice on the branch. And then uh, often ice varies in thickness on the top and bottom of the branch. So you measure both thicknesses and get the average for your report. Kind of complicated, right? Yeah, it is. But uh, it's important that we know the, how much ice is accumulated. Um, and, and so uh, we do appreciate you taking the time to get these measurements and to get them as accurate as possible. You can also measure flat ice accumulation on say a top of a post or a porch railing. And so the, the important thing is no matter how you measure the ice accumulation, communicate how you measured it in your report. Tell us that it's a flat ice measurement. Tell us if it's a radial ice measurement or how, you know, maybe you could put in the remarks measured on tree limbs. That way we know the difference because um, there is a big difference. You can actually see the equation here. Flat ice measurement is equal to the radial ice divided by 0 0.4. So uh, they're, they're quite a bit different. We need to know how the measurement was taken. Again, there's some more training here from our folks, our friends at the Coco Raws 
um, which I'll talk about in a minute, but you can get some more uh, training on uh, in-depth training on how to properly measure ice. So that may be good to to bring up and refresh yourself if we are forecasting an ice storm. Now there's a couple of ways that you can send your reports to us. Uh, actually, many ways you can send us reports reports to us. So this is our web page on the left. If you go to weather.gov/charlestonwv, it'll pull up our web page. In order to send us a report, we've got a web page together that kind of summarizes this. It's at the bottom, the green thunderstorm icon there. Just click on that and it'll take you to this page. And uh, at the top of this page is how to report. Uh, in the middle is what to report. And at the bottom is links that you can go to to view the reports that we send back out to the world. So one of the easiest ways for you to give us a report is uh, for you to give us a report is this web-based form. So I'm actually gonna go through it and it, it's a, a simple form um, that asks you for you what, what type of weather you're going to report. And so let's say we're going to report snowfall. And you can see it populates the time, the date. Say we're, I want to forecast four, I want to predict um, or observe four inches of snow. I actually measured it. So that's another important thing. If you uh, just estimating it um, or measuring it, let us know. You can put in a remark. Um, let's put in, um, say it's a heavy wet snow. And then if you're on a smartphone, uh, you can click this and it'll pull you in your device's location if you've got that uh, setting turned on right. Um, where I'm on a PC here, I'll just type in our new office location. And then click find address and it'll plot me. And so then I can go next. And here's a summary of my report. Puts the latitude, longitude in there, the date, time. Um, if you wish, you can provide your name. Um, if we keep this internal, so but it is nice to know who sent the report. And uh, if you're a train spotter, this is important. See this little drop down menu? If you're a train spotter, which you're on this uh, presentation, you, you are a train spotter or you will be when we're done. Uh, be sure to select train spotter because that way we can give you um, proper attribution for your report. When the report goes out, it'll say that it's from a trained spotter there. And then you just hit submit report. Within a minute, we'll get a notification on our system internal here at the office and we'll see your report and then we'll sh end, end up uh, shipping that out as a local storm report so the world can see it. So a very simple way for you to get your reports to us. Uh, you can also use our spotter hotline, uh, which we've given out to all of our trained spotters. And uh, if you're taking this training and you're not a trained spotter for us, we'll have some instructions at the end on how to get that spotter hotline number. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, those are great ways to get your reports to us. We monitor social media, Facebook and Twitter during events. Uh, we have an email address that you can send your reports to us. If you don't use social media, if you got pictures of maybe the snow, um, you know, you can use social media or that email address. And then the MPing app. So um, this is an app, but there's a, a link here that'll take you to more information about it. And so this is a great way to get your reports to us. And so I'm gonna pull up, these are the actual reports that have been sent in across the country uh, within the past few minutes. Now, again, I'm gonna talk about forecasting winter storms in, in here in a minute, and it's very complicated. And we are very rarely in, in our region, are we just, you know, hey, it's gonna snow everywhere. We're in that transition zone uh, where we get a whole mixture of precipitation. And so you can use this app to tell us exactly what's going on in your neighborhood. And it's extremely valuable information for us meteorologists. So you can see all these reports are just people using this app to let us know it's snowing. So it's snowing all over Vermont, back in New York, even some um, rain snow mix here off the Great Lakes, um, some rain snow mix here around Chicago. But mostly this is all snow. And so these are uh, uh, extremely helpful again to us. So that's MPing, it's available on Apple, Android. All you gotta do is go to your app store and download it. And then it's just a couple of little clicks on your screen to get us a report. Okay, so that's the ways to report to us. You know, there's, uh, there's several there. And again, if you, you, know, you forget, you can always go to this webpage and get more information, get the links to these, uh, these um, ways to report to us. And then you can also find out, click the different tabs here as a refresher of what we need to know about and how to best um, take those measurements. What about amateur radio? Got a lot of my uh, amateur radio friends on here. I see the names and um, I just, uh, first off, I appreciate what you do. Give you an update. We have moved into our new location here at the Tech Park. Uh, we've got our um, uh, equipment getting set up. Um, 
We've got all new amateur radio equipment, and so we're really excited to get that set up. As you can imagine, moving into a new building, there's a lot of loose ends that need to be tied up that our electronics technicians have been working on. Uh, but hopefully we can get the, the equipment all up and running, and then um, you're going to be hearing a lot more from me uh, once we do. And so uh, we're going to be doing a lot more outreach with our amateur radio friends and, and hopefully setting up ways that you can communicate with us, whether if it's not on the air, um, then it's uh, some other system. But I know there is a wealth of, of knowledge and interest out there in the amateur radio community wanting to help us out and, and we can really use it. And so um, uh, I'm excited about that and I'm looking forward to getting back on the air and um, using the, uh, the, the, the equipment to actually get some reports in here and uh, if not have operators actually come in our, our building um, and operate during events, which I think we've had in the past. So we'll work out all those details, but we are in the new building and everything's looking, uh, uh, looking pretty good. So you'll hear more from me and, uh, in the future. And Coco Raws. So some of you on here are Coco Raws observers. And uh, if you're not, uh, this is a great way to get your reports to us as well. It's a little more labor intensive. Um, it requires you to get a, a rain gauge. You can see the rain gauge here at the top of the screen. I'll click on the link here to get more information. But um, um, it's a network of volunteer weather observers. And uh, they do ask you to purchase one of these um, rain gauges. They cost about 35 bucks, um, but they're, they measure up to 11 inches of rain. Um, and you know it's 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 a manual measurement, which is very important because we have all this automated equipment out there measuring rainfall. Um, but we don't have any automated equipment measuring snow, so we rely on human beings to actually measure the snow. And Coco Raws is a daily measurement, so you go out every day, typically around seven in the morning, and uh, and take your measurement of rain and snow. You send it in over an app or over the PC, and we see that. And that's what we use as ground truth um, uh, with the rainfall to check our radar estimates and the information we have coming in there. And with the snowfall, again, other than spotters and 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 that's it. That's that's how we know how much snow fell is through Kokoraz observers or spotters. So um, there's more information here on how to become a Kokoraz observer. And I'll show you the website here and um, click on the map to show you how many, here we go, show you how many um, co-op or Kokoraz observers that we have. So here you go, here's the map of all the reports that were sent in this morning. And you can see there's a lot of empty real estate here across our region, um, especially down in Northeast Kentucky, Southwest Virginia, lots of, uh, lots of voids so we could use some more observers. So if you're interested, again, it is a daily commitment. We do ask for observations every day. It really only takes a couple of minutes. I've been a Coco Ross observer since I think 2008. And I just go out every morning and I take my measurements and use this handy little app here um, to send in my reports. And it just takes a couple of minutes um, and I get those reports in and, and we use them. So. Uh, if you want some more information, again, these slides will have it available, or you can just uh, Google Coco Raw, C O C O R A H S, for some more information on that. Okay, so um, I see some questions coming in. That's great, awesome. Uh, so again, we'll get to that at the end with the question and answer session. So don't hesitate to type in a question there. See some good questions. Can't wait to get to them. Um, Forecasting winter weather. So we've talked about how bad it can get around here. We've we've talked about how to observe and report winter weather to us. Now let's talk about why that's so important. So winter storms. Um, I love winter weather. Um, I hate forecasting it because <laughs> because it it's so tough. Um, I spent a couple years up in Alaska uh, when I got in the weather service, and um, it, it, it's tough there. It's tough here. I lived in East Tennessee. It's tough there. You know, it's just uh, it's a really tough thing to do, and it's probably one of the hardest things we do. So, in order to get a, a good winter storm, you need three key ingredients. That's cold air, moisture, lift. You know, if you've been in my spring spotter classes, you've heard me talk about the key ingredients for thunderstorms. Winter storms are no different. You have to have that cold air. You have to have a source of moisture, which typically for us is the Gulf of Mexico, uh, but sometimes it can be the Great Lakes. Um, uh, lake effect snow is definitely something that we have to deal with. And then we need lift. Uh, and typically that's in the form of a, a low pressure system. Um, and so that low track, you can see on the diagram here to the west and northwest of that low, that's where the snow falls. 
and then to the north of the warm front there's a wintry mix and then south of the warm front you can get those thunderstorms so that surface low track is extremely important now what we did and uh, is we looked at our climate sites and we looked at the top 10 winter storms for those climate sites and so i plotted those out and um, looked at the low tracks and you can definitely see that for and i'm going to go through each of our climate sites here starting with huntington check out all those uh tracks of those surface lows they start in the northern gulf of mexico around louisiana alabama mississippi and they track up through south carolina north carolina off into southeast virginia and then off the coast now look at uh charleston pretty much the same track there right so different storms you can see the dates and the, and everything change but uh same kind of track talk about parkersburg again southeast virginia is kind of a key location there uh, for the track around norfolk virginia elkins kind of the same kind of track pattern and then we look at beckley you can see a little swirly quirly gig there that's actually superstorm sandy back in um, uh, 2012 you can see the odd track that storm had but the others pretty much along the same northern gulf of mexico up through georgia south carolina eastern north carolina and within 50 100 miles of norfolk virginia so that's kind of the key track to get a good heavy uh, snow for our region if that low tracks a little bit further to the northwest we may just get rain or a wintry mix if that low tracks off to the southeast just a little bit just a little bit we might not get anything at all so the low track is extremely important now another key consideration is uh, what we call the warm nose it's a, a warm layer of air that comes in um, from the gulf of mexico comes up from moves south to north and typically it kind of moves up west of the mountains and um, if that warm layer of air you know extends all the way down to the ground pretty far up into the the, the air mass then that snow falls and it melts as rain and continues as rain all the way down to the ground now if the warm nose is um, kind of shallow but um, you know there's still some cold air near the ground so the snow falls melts into rain and then it doesn't have enough cold air to refreeze it but once it hits the ground or the tree limbs or power lines it refreezes into ice that's freezing rain now if that warm nose is pretty shallow and there's a deep layer of cold air below it the snow will melt in that warm air and then refreeze into sleet and or ice pellets and then of course if the entire air mass is below freezing uh, then you get snow so that's what causes that um, our area to see a lot of times it's mixed precipitation that warm air comes up to the north from the gulf of mexico funnels up to the west of the appalachian mountains and uh, up floods up north over our region so but it's very difficult to know sometimes how deep that warm air is how far north it's getting and that's because this the the lack of observations in our region now the map on the left shows you surface observation locations so these are all the airport locations where there's observing equipment either AWOS or ASOS locations this is just the airports we've got a whole bunch of you all have personal weather stations at your house you may have them hooked up to weather underground or the citizens weather observer program so we're able to see that data um, we also have mesonets kentucky has a great mesonet state of west virginia has an iflows network with weather gauges um, there's a lot of surface observation out there and, and so we have a pretty good handle what's going on at the surface on the right map though this is all the upper air balloon launch locations across the country so these locations we launch weather balloons twice a day 7 a.m and 7 p.m and those weather balloons give us a snapshot of the atmosphere all the way up to 100,000 feet or more up and so um, you notice that we're kind of in a void here uh, wilmington ohio launches one of these pittsburgh does over on the east side of the mountains roanoke and then nashville but none we don't do it we don't do it here um, we do have access to some aircraft data as planes some of the planes land and take off they have weather observing equipment on them and we can get soundings that way uh, but you can see again we're in a void here um, so a lot of times we're making assumptions about how warm that temperature is two three four thousand feet above the ground and the models are making assumptions as well and sometimes they're right sometimes they're wrong 
but that lack of observations above the surface really hurts our ability to forecast winter storms. Like I said before, sometimes we're waiting on that precipitation to start, to see what it's starting as, to know, and sometimes we have to shift gears really quick and update that forecast when we see that it's starting, uh, when the, where the model said it was gonna start maybe as snow, and it starts as freezing rain. We know at that particular moment that that warm layer of air is a lot warmer and thicker than what the models thought. And sometimes we have to shift gears really quick. So that's why your reports are, are, are so important. Forecasting snow amount is the hardest thing that we do. We have to get the temperature correct. Again, not only at the surface, which is not that difficult, although it's hard enough, but two, three, four thousand feet above the ground where we don't have the measurements. We got to get that right. We have to get the amount of liquid correct. So rainfall, forecasting how much rain is going to fall is the second hardest thing we do. A lot of variables there. And then we have to get the ratio right. Is it going to be a wet snow? Is it going to be dry snow? What's the ratio of liquid to snow going to be? If we get any of that wrong, and we will, um, wish I had a nickel for every time I've heard, um, when I tell people I'm a meteorologist, that uh, I wish I could get, you know, be wrong 50% of the time and, and still get paid. If I had a nickel for every time I'd heard that, I'd be rich. Um, but we are going to be wrong. If you think about how complex the atmosphere is and and how we uh, how we model it and try to do the best we can, we will be wrong. And so the snowfall forecast is going to be different than our forecast if we get any of these variables wrong. So that's why we like to use ranges. Uh, we'll we'll communicate two to four inches of snow or, or four to eight or uh, you know six to ten. Uh, we like to use those ranges to kind of um, give you an idea of how much snow is going to fall. So there's a lot of good um, information on our website for uh, for situational awareness for winter storms. I'm going to show you a few tools that we have available, but the important thing is is get your local for get your forecast local for winter storms. A lot of us may use the app on our phone um, uh, for day to day to find out you know what do I need to wear a jacket today? Is it going to rain today? Uh, but when it comes to winter storms, the complexity that they have. Um, Get your forecast local. It's local media. It's us. You know, we live in the community. We've got forecasters here that have been here for 25 plus years that that understand how the weather works here. They add that expertise to the forecast. And so um, same with our media partners. You know, there's some that have been around here for a long time and they have a lot of knowledge there and a lot of expertise. So get that uh, forecast local. Um, but uh, again, our website's weather.gov slash Charleston WV. A lot of graphics, uh, point and click forecast on there. Uh, which is the graphic that should pop up here. There you go. Uh, this is, uh, you can go to weather.gov slash your zip code and um, that'll take you to this page. And it's a page just devoted for that local area. And it'll give you the seven day forecast, the current conditions, uh, what have you. Okay, so uh, mobile.weather.gov. I uh, may not know about this one been around for a while let's go to it and demo it here so if you go to mobile.weather.gov it kind of works like an app um, we don't have an app per se but this is kind of works like an app on a, in a browser so um, say we want to look up um, let's look up Huntington West Virginia and let's say go so when you type in your location, you get the current conditions at the the latest, the closest airport, and then here's your forecast. You can, uh, they're working on the radar. The radar doesn't work right now, the snapshot, but they're working on that. Uh, you can get satellite, you can get the forecast discussion, but the forecast is, is kind of what I want to talk about here because you can actually dive down and hit the little plus sign and get the uh, hourly forecast for your location. Uh, so that's important information um, at times. So that's mobile.weather.gov. We're also, like I said, Facebook, Twitter, at NWS Charleston WV. Uh, like us, follow us. Uh, we post weather information there. NOAA Weather Radio is a great way to get weather information 24-7 with a click of a button. And, of course, local TV and radio. Uh, again, get that weather information local. Uh, here's that um, uh, weather.gov slash your zip code. You know, if you go to that page and scroll down, you'll see an hourly weather graph. This is a great way to see the hourly information, the detail that we add to that forecast. So if you're wanting to know when the snow is going to start, when's it going to be its heaviest, uh, you can get those details. What's the temperature going to be at, you know, 10 o'clock tomorrow, you can get those details 
from this hourly weather graph. Now we have a winter page that's devoted specifically for winter weather forecast information. So uh, if you go to our website, weather.gov, look for the little blue icon down here that's got a snowflake in it, and uh, that is our uh, winter page. Click on it and it'll take you there. So we've actually got um, a little bit of snow in the forecast, so I can probably show you some real world examples here and uh, um, let this pop up. So we've got a little bit of snow. I'm going to click on West Virginia and show you the whole region. And you can see there's a little bit of snow tomorrow in the forecast. And um, this is our expected snowfall. You can see it's mainly up into uh, the northern part of West Virginia. Um, this is how much we're actually expecting. But then, uh, as I told you before, um, there's a lot of complicating factors when it comes to winter storms. So um, this is the high end amount. If you look at the, um, uh, say the worst case scenario and all the models that we look at, um, and you'll see that here. And then if you look at the best case scenarios here. So there's not a lot of range, just some light snow. Actually, I can take you up to Buffalo, New York. Should be real exciting over the next few days up there. Let's look at their winter page, and this is a much better. Um, yeah, here we go. So here's their expected snowfall uh, coming up, and you can see all the way through Sunday. 48 inches of snow is what they're expecting in Buffalo, and then you can see the potential range of possibilities. Well, <laughs> not much more than there's 49 inches, and the best case scenario, 34 inches. So going to get a lot of snow in Buffalo, but that gives you an illustration of how to use that page. So I'm going to go back to hours. We also have some timing graphics on there and a whole lot of just snow and ice forecast information on this page. Uh, winter storm severity index, you'll see a tab devoted to that and the winter storm outlook. So let's go back to my slides here and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But I did want to communicate to for you all folks uh, in, in West Virginia, again, you can go to our page and get the uh, forecast snowfall for the entire state. If you live in Ohio and you want to see, well, how much snow is going to fall um, over the state of Ohio, you can actually go to Wilmington, Ohio National Weather Service page. They produce the forecast graphics for the entire state of Ohio. So you can see here, forecasting a lot of snow up near Cleveland with that lake effect, but just light amounts elsewhere. So those statewide graphics are available. We can get the, you can get the links here uh, to see those. Uh, for you all that live outside of the state of West Virginia, they are um, available. But if you live in our, our service area, uh, you can get to those from our webpage. Now, the winter, winter storm severity index. Um, this is a neat product, and um, I've heard some, a lot of good feedback on this from some emergency management friends and some others. Uh, so I do encourage you to use this. This is a great way to kind of categorize the um, severity of the winter storm that may be in the forecast. And it goes out, it looks at the uh, forecast for the next 72 hours, and it looks at six different meteorological and non-meteorological factors, such as snow load, how much, what's the weight of the snow, the snow amount, ice accumulation, uh, ground blizzard, which we don't deal with a whole lot here, but uh, flash freeze is a big one. You know, maybe it's raining and then the rain shuts off, but the temperature plummets well below freezing. And that sets up a situation where you can get a flash freeze. And so that's factored in here and blowing snow as well. So you can see it's color coded, um, goes from yellow all the way up to purple. And based on the color coding, you can see what kind of impact is this storm going to have? And, and so we can kind of look at this, um, click on the link here, and we don't have a lot going on in our region, but let's go back up to the Great Lakes. And yeah, this lake effect snow band here off of, of Lake Erie in Ontario is expected to have extreme impacts. Uh, what does that mean? Um, you can expect extremely dangerous or impossible driving conditions, extensive and widespread closures and disrupt disruptions to infrastructure. Life-saving actions may be needed in these areas over the next few days. So uh, a, a great way to kind of categorize the severity of an upcoming winter storm. Another product we have is a graphical hazardous weather outlook. Again, that's available from our webpage. If you look down at the bottom, the little or, or, uh, brown um, square with the different weather elements in it, it says uh, graphical hazards and you click on that and this is kind of a snapshot of the weather hazards over the next week. The, uh, uh, in fact, I can go ahead and click on a current version of this to show you what hours looks like 
and so it will default to the worst kind of thing that's going on over the next week and uh, and for us it's a snow and sleet risk for friday and friday night in the mountains um, and so you can see on the right are these little chicklets these little squares that kind of light up whenever there's a weather weather threat in that area and you can click on that square and it'll change the map so you can see where these weather um, problems are going to be and so most of these like wind are going to be up in the mountains uh, there is a statewide version of this for the entire state of west virginia that you can access from the drop down menu there and statewide versions are also available for ohio from the uh, national weather service wilmington and for kentucky from national weather service in louisville um, i don't believe virginia is set up yet but i think the wakefield office is working on that so that's our hazardous weather outlook the graphical version okay so winter weather outlook um, let's talk about it. So uh, everybody kind of starts asking us questions about the month of August. And I think that's why, uh, um, the, I think the reason for that is the uh, Farmer's Almanac comes out in the month of August and folks get that and they start to look at that. Um, a lot of people do the woolly worm search and I do my own little woolly worm canvas around the office and at home. And here's a couple uh, images that I've gotten this fall and the one on the right really troubles me. Um, that's a little scary there, that white one, but uh, all kinds of different woolly worms out there. The persimmon seed forecast, you know, I spent 12 years in Kentucky working at the Jackson Weather Service office, and this was a big one. Uh, people swore by the persimmon seed forecast, which is, uh, you know, you cut a persimmon seed open, and if it shows a spoon inside, that means you're going to be shoveling snow all winter. If it had a fork or knife, it meant something different, but all this is folklore. You know, I've heard uh, heard different folks talking about the um, um, uh, yellow jackets nest or hornets nest and how high they're low they are up in a tree so um, you know don't put much stock in these uh, don't put much stock in the farmer's almanac a lot of people swear by it um, if you look at the farmer's almanac and the old farmer's almanac we're in for rough winters either way uh, but the problem with these is i don't know how they make their forecast they don't publicize that um, and one of these i think it's the farmer's almanac has been showing a cold and very snowy winter for about the past four winters and it hasn't really panned out. So uh, we kind of tend to rely on science and, and we rely really on one of the biggest factors is uh, the La Nina or El Nino, the water temperature patterns in the Pacific Ocean. And so this is one of the um, easiest, of, not easiest, but probably the most confidence that we have in any kind of uh, seasonal forecast is is related to how strong or how confident we are on the La Nina or El Nino. And, and so this winter is going to be the third winter in a row that we have water temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. You can see here on this, this map, this blue in the central Pacific Ocean here. Here's North America, uh, South America, and this blue is in the central Pacific and it's showing above normal uh, excuse me, below normal water temperatures. And so that's La Nina. If it was the opposite, if it was warmer than normal, that's El Nino. Both patterns really influence the weather across the Northern Hemisphere, especially. And so the, the typical weather that you see in a La Nina is shown here in the bottom right. And the, typically the cold air is, uh, exists from Alaska down in the Western Canada and the Northern Plains. Uh, the jet stream drops down into the Ohio Valley and then uh, shifts to the northeast so that storm track likes to come up the Ohio Valley and produce a lot of rain it's wetter than normal for the Ohio Valley whereas the southeast is drier than normal and warmer than normal um, so um, you know last winter was another La Nina winter it was the second La Nina winter in a row and it behaved pretty normal uh, the top image is a county average temperature anomaly so uh, the Ohio Valley um, West Virginia Virginia was above normal last winter and we were wet. Uh, you can see all the green here across the Ohio Valley and West Virginia up into New York showing that it was above normal precipitation. So that's pretty much what we expect. The previous winter, however, was odd. Um, you know, we had all this cold air down in Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma was colder than normal. Y'all remember probably the, the extreme cold that hit Texas during the month of February. Uh, that shouldn't happen in a La Nina winter. So there's some other things that went on that kind of counteracted the typical La Nina signal. And those um, those kind of patterns are much harder to predict. Um, and even parts of the Ohio Valley was uh, below normal precipitation that winter. So 
here's our forecast um, uh, but you know understand that there could be some other complicating factors but the, the the current seasonal forecast for december january and february from NOAA and the weather service is uh based heavily on that la nina forecast and it, it, it is for a, a greater than uh, normal temperatures warmer than normal temperatures uh, over most of our region and wetter than normal precipitation so looks like a warmer than normal and a wetter than normal winter ahead based on the uh, the outlook from the folks at the Climate Prediction Center. And so with that, you know, it's been wet for a while now. So we can kind of expect, you know, we did dry out a little bit this fall. We can expect a little bit more of a, an uptick in precipitation and, and you know, maybe uh, flooding uh, could be another concern as we go through the winter into next spring. It's something we're definitely going to have to be mindful of and uh, and watch out for is is more flooding episodes you may be wondering about snowfall uh well we don't uh, the weather service doesn't issue a seasonal snowfall forecast because it is very complicated hard to do hard enough to forecast snow a day or two in advance let alone a, a month or two in advance um, but we can look at all the past la nina winters all the way back to 1950 and kind of look and lump those together and see what the snowfall uh, tendency was and for our region here in the ohio valley in west virginia uh, we typically run normal to uh, below normal snowfall in La Nina winters, but uh, there have been some major winter events in La Nina winters. So just because the forecast is for a warmer than normal and wetter than normal winter, I understand that that even in a below normal snowfall winter, it only takes one storm to do a, a lot of damage. And uh, there's been some big ones. Uh, the snowy winter of 1995-96, that's actually one of the snowiest winters on record for our region. That was a La Nina winter. So it's complicated. Seasonal forecasting is complicated, but the overall trend is uh, is typically a, a, a little less snow than average uh, for our region in La Nina winters. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation as far as that goes. I hope you got some good information. Um, I'm going to go to the question and answers here in a minute. I've got a bunch of questions on here, so that's that's great. Um, but I did want to provide a little bit of a follow-up. So if you are a spotter for us, you're already in our database, nothing's changed, that's great. Uh, what you will all will see um, at about an hour after this is over, you'll get an email. And in that will be uh, some links and some information. Um, if, you've, if you're not a registered spotter for us, there'll be a link to a registration form in there. Fill that out. We'll get your information. We'll shoot you back an email in a couple of days uh, with our spotter hotline and some more information on it. If you're already a spotter for us, um, you know you're in our system. You don't have to take an action on that. Um, there is a feedback form in there. I would love for you to click on that and provide feedback on this webinar. What you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, what do you want to hear about in the future for future trainings? Um, and then um, there's also a link to our weather spotter page. So what we'll do is we'll record this training and, and we'll slap it on that weather spotter page. So, um, and I'll also distribute this to our weather spotter email list. So folks that couldn't attend can watch the training if they want to in a recorded fashion. I'll also provide the slides. The slides are great because you can pull them up and you can go to those links and they'll, they'll be dynamic. So you can click on a link that's in the slide. Maybe you wanna further investigate some of the information that I provided today. You can do that in those slides. So again, I'll make sure all that's distributed to our, our, spotter, um, our spotter email list. Um, so that's how that's gonna work. All right, so let's go to the questions and Let's see what we've got here. So we've got a lot. So I'm going to start from the top. And let's see. What's the main difference between winter weather and winter storms? Well, there's not much of a difference there. Winter storms are winter weather. Um, but uh, winter storms, when we add the storm, that typically means it's more severe. Um, so that's that's a different terminology there. Rustine uh, passed along ready.gov. Yeah, it's a great website. Um, to go get some preparedness information uh, to get prepared for winter weather. Um, is there a tracking mechanism for how many spotters there are and when an individual was trained or retrained? Um, uh, Jamie, I have that information internally, um, so I can tell uh, for most situations when someone was trained. Um, we keep all of our spotter information internal, so we don't have any way to look that up. But if you're interested, you want to know uh, how long it's been since you've been trained or whatever, um, we can provide that information 
and you do ask about how many spotters we have. Um, I think we're over 900 now. Um, I have to look, but I'm pretty sure we're over 900. And it does vary. You know, there's a lot in the um, the metro areas like Charleston and Huntington, Parkersburg, uh, Athens, but um, um, we have them scattered pretty much all over. We can always use more. So good question. Uh, does the weather spotter reporting carry the same weight if a spotter is out of state? Um, so if you communicate, and that's one other thing, that's, that's a good point. If you uh, send us a report, no matter how you do it, always try to indicate that you're a trained weather spotter for us because we do give extra weight to spotters um, because we know that you've had the training um, and you know what to report than we do just some person on Facebook sending us a report because believe it or not, people will lie to you on Facebook. Um, but so if you are a spotter, be sure to put that in, in the uh, report. And even if you're out of state, you know, a lot of spotters, they take training in another state and then they move or whatever. It doesn't matter where you've had the training, just as long as you've had the training. So be sure to indicate that. Why doesn't each city or reporting station airport take snow measurements? So Michael, that's a great question. Uh, many of our airports, um, well, I'll say some of our airports do. Um, uh, Charleston, Huntington Airport has um, weather observers nearby that measure snow for us. Elkins has observers and Beckley has actual snowfall observers uh, to measure the snow. So um, those do. And, and um, so that's a good question. Good question there. What is the National Weather Service Amateur Radio call sign and what frequencies do you monitor? So Richard, that's a good question. We don't have an actual uh, amateur radio call sign. It's something we're going to be working on. I think we typically do for um, like Skywarn Recognition Day, which is coming up, we have a special call. Um, so that's something we're going to be getting. So, and frequencies, uh, that's another thing. Um, we're going to have to figure out what, what are the best frequencies that we, we can reach from our office. And then for those locations that we can't reach on, say, two meter radio, what um, maybe set up some kind of situation where we have net controls in our National Weather Service chat room when there's an event they can pass on reports to us so that's some of the work that I'm going to be doing in the coming months uh, when we get our equipment up and, and running. Uh, BJ asked do Davis weather station rain gauges work as a Coco Ross report? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Coco Ross it does not so Coco Ross um, they do require the actual manual rain gauge and I typically have one sitting around here somewhere but I don't right now but um, they don't want the automated gauges. And uh, there's a good reason for that because um, they want actual human observations uh, to check, to be a kind of a check on those automated systems that we're, gener we're pulling in. Um, so that's why they actually want you to use a manual rain gauge that you actually look at and measure. So good question. All right, so let's go down. Joe Stevens, uh, do you want different observations such as thunder snow? Also, do you want observations from home and then work location? Yeah, that's great. Um, so MPing, that's one limitation of MPing app is you can't report thunder. I wish you could, um, but it's not in there. But yes, if you use, uh, say, the online reporting form, you can put that in the remarks that you had thunder. And then, yeah, we'll take work, home, you know, if you're traveling in between and stop at a rest area or something like that and could stick a, uh, a ruler in the snow and give us a measurement, we'll take all we can get. Um, so, yeah, anywhere you're, you're at and if you use that app um, or you use online reporting form, you know, it'll put it'll get your location so we know where you're at. Uh, Joshua Murdoch, the dreaded warm wedge. Yes, yes. It's uh, it's not fun. Um, if we get a heavy snow, do you want to know how heavy? And how do you do that? Yeah, Russ, um, typically when we use the word heavy, you know, it's heavy, heavy, wet snow. So if you're getting a snow that's really weighing down the tree limbs, um, uh, you know, you're getting power outages. That's that's what I mean by wet snow. The the lighter snow is, um, you know, you can take a leaf blower or broom and wipe off your porch with it. Those are the lighter snows. So, yeah, um, we can typically figure that out. Um, but you could add those remarks, especially if you're getting some kind of impacts like that. And as far as the uh, rate of snow, you know, if your visibility is less than a quarter of a mile, that's heavy snow. Uh, that's how we, we rate that. Um, you're only as accurate or right if the people on the ground do our job. So the 50-50 argument is like someone complaining about politics who don't vote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jamie, I, I appreciate that. Uh, not everybody sees it that way, but uh, uh, I appreciate those comments. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so he's saying the woolly worms are not the usual weather predicting. <laughs> yeah, and, and Russ, yeah, hornet's nests are high up in the trees. I saw some at the almost the top of the tree the other day. Um, and uh, Jamie has another question. Why do you think individuals in West Virginia don't sign up to be spotters? Actually, we have uh, quite a few um, that do sign up to be spotters. So it's not the fact that they don't. It's that, that we have a lot of rural areas in our state. Um, and so few people in some areas are few and far between. So that's why we uh, we lack spotters in those more rural areas. And and so uh, if you do live in a rural area, for sure, uh, send us those reports. But um, but but yeah, um, that that's why that is. Just uh, it just so happens to be that way. Um, how does wind impact accuracy of rain and snow measurements? Very good question. Um, Luckily in our region, we don't deal with wind that much. I lived in an area in Alaska where I dealt with wind quite a bit and you could almost measure the snow better on the side of a building instead of on your snowboard. Um, but that's why it's important to, to, if you do have a lot of wind and you notice in drifts, that you take multiple measurements out in your uh, observing area and you average those together. Um, so, you know, if you, if you have take a measurement and you've got nine inches in one spot and you take a measurement and you've got six in another and an eight, and you take those measurements and average them together, that'll give you a good idea of the, of the snow. But that can be a real problem. You know, if you have those drifts, don't take a measurement in the highest drift and don't take a measurement in the bare spot, you know, try to find an area that's kind of in the middle and then take multiple measurements. So, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, are there any specific dimensions for the snowboard? Uh, uh, typically, it's two feet by two feet, um, but yeah, foot by foot is fine. Uh, two foot by two foot just gives you a lot of room, and then also with uh, a two foot by two foot, um, uh, you can like measure on half the board, and you can clean half the board off, and that'll be your new snow measurement the next time, and then you can use the other half for your depth if you wanted to do that, or you could just put two measure two boards out. Uh, Whether many elite storm spotter trainings offered for our region, uh, we don't. I don't do those. I know the Paducah office in Western Kentucky does those elite storm spotter trainings. Um, I typically do the advanced spotters maybe once or twice a year, and so next spring we may offer that, and I'll probably do that virtually if I do. But that's a good question. It's something we can look at, uh, Joshua, for sure. Uh, Robert, home weather station recommendations. I have a Davis Instruments unit, but would love a professional opinion. Um, there's a bunch of good ones out there. Um, I have a Davis station myself. I'm not supposed to uh, play favorites with the different kinds out there, but I actually do have a Davis station myself. And I know a lot of folks around our uh, emergency management uh, are, are actually installing those stations. They're great stations. They last a long time. They're a little pricey. Um, um, some of the some of the less expensive versions are great. You just they might not just last as long as a, a Davis would. So. Uh, the important thing is, is no matter what you get, um, is make sure that it's well sided. Um, you know, you don't want to install your temperature sensor over pavement or on a roof. You know, you want to uh, install that over grass and you want to put your anemometer up as high as you can to get good, accurate wind measurements as safely as you can, of course. But we understand that there's limitations. Um, uh, with with where these things are located, but it's important to kind of do your research and 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 put the work in to actually get the station sited and properly uh, put up, and that that'll really help your your measurements. Um, the mobile app is called Mping M P I N G. Um, hopefully you can understand my Tennessee accent M P I N G, and you should be able to search for that on your on your phone. Uh, let's see, got some more questions here. Would you recommend using GFS models for 10 today weather outlooks or do you use SPC for winter weather outlooks? A uh, good question. I don't trust 10 to 15 day weather outlooks no matter where they're coming from. Um, it's about seven days is, is, is about as far as you can, you can go. Yeah, they're fine. The GFS has that information. Uh, but it's not real reliable. And yes, we use uh, the WPC Weather Prediction Center Winter Weather Outlooks for sure, and Bryson for sure. Um, isn't there already a National Thunder Lightning Monitoring System? Yep, John, there is. It's uh, the there's a couple of them, and and we use the data there. So um, uh, so yeah, we do track lightning. We can see that. And uh, but still, it's good to if you do observe it, um, it's good to put that into remarks that you did see it. Um, Michael, uh, one of our uh, great Coco Ross observers up in uh, Wood County, 
a very helpful thing is to have two or three outer tubes for cocoa rods measurements. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, one to bring in for melting and one to put out in place while the precipitation still falls. Yes, cocoa rods has some, uh, some great tips on measuring precipitation. If you do want to become a cocoa rods observer, um, you can actually um, uh, weigh the gauges and, and uh, use an equation to get the amount of snow, but having an extra tube so you're, you're able to swap them out when you got snow falling is, is great. And yes, you're, you're exactly right. The third tube is good for using for core, core samples. So thank you, Michael, for that, that information. Um, uh, so you do the reports while we are on vacation, get reported to the state we're in. Yeah, so if you use that um, online report form, the great thing about that is, uh, is no matter where you're at in the country, um, when you when you put your location in there, it knows what weather service office to route it to. So even if you're out of state, doesn't matter. Um, and MPing same way, um, it knows exactly uh, where to send the report. Um, I talked about the well accurate and inexpensive weather station. Yeah, that's uh, they're not very inexpensive. Uh, that's the problem. Um, you do kind of get what you pay for, uh, James. So um, Again, there's a lot of different brands out there. You can get decent ones for a couple hundred bucks. And um, again, it's important how you cite the stations. And if you don't want to fork over the money, you can get one of those Cocoa Ross rain gauges for 35 bucks, set that up and report precipitation to us every day. Uh, that would be a huge help. Uh, Gropple, Don Kemper's asking about Gropple. Um, so Gropple is uh, it's kind of like hail. Um, it looks like a styrofoam balls hitting the ground, um, but it's a, it's a convective kind of snow. And what happens when I say convection, that's uh, upward, upward air moving like a thunderstorm where you have these updrafts and downdrafts. And you can get showers that uh, the snow actually gets kind of tossed around in the cloud and it'll get rhymed. It'll get coated in, in liquid and then refreezed and, and it produces almost kind of a hail, um, but, but almost kind of ice pellets. And it, it looks like um, uh, styrofoam balls. And that's what we, can, we call gropple. And so you can actually report that um, in MPing um, as snow or gropple. Um, but uh, but, but good, good question there. Uh, does wind impact accuracy of rain measurements by gauge? Uh, yeah, it does, um, but not as much as snow. Uh, so if it's really, really blowing out, say a hurricane, um, it can definitely cause rain to miss the gauge um, and cause an undercatch there. So another good question there. And would a parking lot be okay for making snow measurements, Joshua? Um, typically not. We like, um, you know, if it's really, really cold, the asphalt's cold, it'll be fine. But typically the asphalt's a little warmer um, than the ground. And so the, the, the asphalt will cause the snow to melt. And then once the sun's up, also that, that uh, pavement will actually absorb heat from the sun, even if it's cold. And so we typically ask for folks to measure on, on, on non-asphalt surfaces, uh, a little patch of grass, put you a snowboard out on that grass and measure on that. So uh, good question. If some snow from the initial snow amount melts, how do we report the storm total measurement? So that's another good question. So um, there's a lot of different scenarios here and snowfall is not easy. So say you get a snow showery day say you get a snow shower that moves in it drops an inch of snow but then the sun comes out and it melts and then a couple hours later you get another snow shower and another inch of snow uh, well during that period your total snowfall is two inches because you had an inch even though it melted you got another inch you add those together um, now if your snow is falling and it's melting on contact with the ground, then you would just report a trace uh, because it never really accumulated. If it falls and melts and and then the, maybe the temperature drops and then you start accumulating, then your accumulation is just that amount that you can measure. So hopefully that that um, that makes sense. There's a really good book um, called Snow, and the author is Art Judson, and I have one. Yeah, it's over there in my bookshelf, but if I go reach for it, I'm going to pull my microphone out. But you can probably Google it, but it's a in-depth. Uh, if you really want to get into measuring snow, uh, check that book out, and it'll it'll tell you all the different ins and outs of how to measure snow. So good question there. 
do you ever do weather talks to high school students, Jamie? I sure do. Um, be happy to do that. We also have a, a, a neat kind of display here in our office called Science on a Sphere that um, you can come and visit um, and do a tour of the office. But yeah, we, we can actually come to your high school and uh, and do, do weather talks. Uh, usually, typically, uh, do it for much younger students, typically fourth, fifth grade, um, but we can do high school talks as well. Um, do you use the data from the West Virginia Extension Service? Um, you know, that's a good question, Fred. We we don't. We, we do interact with them when it's frost freeze season to try to, we talk with them about the impacts to, that frost and freeze might have. But um, other than that, and I think you're talking about maybe the um, they have a weather station study going on because I actually got one of those weather stations and and put it out and they're using that data so uh, we don't look at that data per se unless the weather stations may be on weather underground or something um, but that's a good question um, what do you think about omega radar versus radar scope um, I actually use radar scope I don't know about omega radar but it's whatever you like it's using the same data uh, radar scope is um, is typically what I use, but um, but yeah, it's whatever works for you um, and, and what you like. Um, but typically, like I said, they're using National Weather Service radar data, so it's the same information getting fed into it. Are there any good radar applications that have um, raw or composite that are more accurate than apps such as Apple Weather or AccuWeather? Um, so, Bryson, again, ac uh, radar scope is probably, um, again, I'm not supposed to pick favorites, but it's what I use. And the reason I like radar scope is because the uh, frequency of the data updates. I mean, really, it lags only a few seconds from what we're looking at inside our office. Uh, it's that quick of an update to the to the radar data. But uh, they're all good and a lot of good, a lot of good apps and services out there. Uh, is there a difference between sleet and grapple? There is. Uh, sleet actually occurs when um, snow melts and then refreezes into, uh, typically it's clear balls of ice. And then grapple is where that snow, it gets turned up in the clouds, it gets uh, 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 tossed around and it gets coated in water and, and is usually white colored. So ice pellets are clear and grapple is white, kind of like styrofoam balls. Can you go over what types of frozen precip to report as snowfall? Yeah, snowfall would include, uh, of course, uh, snowflakes, um, snow grains, or grapple. Um, if it's ice pellets, you would report that as sleet or ice pellets, and then freezing rain is, is, is freezing rain. And Don, Radar Omega is fantastic. I'm going to try it out. I will try it out because I have not used that one. Uh, what do you think of HD Doppler Radar, Jared? I've not used that. I'll have to check that one out as well. And uh, refer to an industry as <laughs> Yeah, Joe, you about got me there. Um, so I saw the questions I see. Um, yeah, I think I got everybody. Some great questions there. This, is, uh, this has been fantastic. I think we had over 80 folks on the training tonight, and I'm sure a lot more will see the recorded version. So this has been great. I know we've gone over a little bit. Um, I only meant for it to be an hour, but the questions were so good. I wanted to cover every one of them. So uh, thank you all for attending. Again, um, look for more information in an email from uh, GoToWebinar and me uh, within about an hour with some more information. Um, otherwise, I hope you have a great holiday season, and uh, I really look forward to seeing your reports and hearing from you throughout the winter as those winter storms um, come in. And uh, I'll go ahead and put the last slide on here that has my email. Feel free to, uh, to shoot me an email if you have a question or need more information, you can always also hit us up on Twitter, Facebook. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to us um, and, and we'll answer your question. But again, thank you. I appreciate your time and attention and I hope you have a great evening and a great holiday season. Take care.